So wonderful, so awesome, omnipotent. How many know he's worthy to be praised? Amen. He is. He is worthy. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I love worshiping him. I love praising him. I love serving him. I love talking about him. I love boasting about him. I love reminding people about him. I love lifting him up. I love glorifying him. I just love the Lord. Anybody just love him this morning? Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. We thank God for our music department. We thank God for our choir and those who have given you a snippet of our African American History Month and what will take place on next week. Thank God for our ushers, those in the AV room. We thank you, God, for all of those who are with our youth and our children at their church services. And we praise God for all of you, God's chosen people. Give God a big hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. He is so worthy. And uh, I am grateful to be here today one more time in the presence of the Lord and in the fellowship of the saints. Amen. So it's good to be in a fellowship. And uh, we're going to continue with our theme. Got a lot to go through. We're going to try to get through this. But uh, one of the things, you know, our theme for the year is living by faith. And uh, that's not just a slogan. It's a command. You know, in Habakkuk, the second chapter, verse 4, tells us that the just shall live by faith. You know, in Romans 1, 17, it says, the just shall live by faith. In Hebrews, I mean, not Hebrews, but uh, Galatians 3 and 11 says, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews uh, 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is a lifestyle that you and I are called to live, and everything in Christianity hinges on our faith. 
and uh, not our traditions, not what we like, what we don't like, and not our denominational beliefs and tenets. It all hinges on faith, but faith has to be biblical. Amen. You know, because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith literally comes from a Greek word and a root word, should I say, that means to be fully persuaded. But you can be fully persuaded about a lot of things. In fact, you can be fully persuaded about something that's wrong. And so our faith is not just about being fully persuaded, it's fully persuaded in the word of God and in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so I want to talk to you this morning as we continue to talk about faith, and I want us to look at it from a different perspective about the faith that we fight for, because in many cases when we think about fighting for faith, we're talking about just getting from day to day, how to make it, how to stay faithful, how not to sin. But I want us to look at it from a different perspective that the Bible talks about. And I want to turn to two passages of scripture. The first one is 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. And then the second one is going to be in Jude, verses 3 and 4. But in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, verses 12 through 14, and I'm reading from the King, New King James Version, I'm going to uh, share with you these words. Paul, in writing to his spiritual son Timothy, says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus' return, which he will manifest in his own time and who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, in Jude, if you will, uh, verses 3 and 4, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all, deliver to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me, if you will. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the privilege to share this, your truth. May your word go forth and not return unto you, Lord, but accomplish the purpose for which you've sent it, and God will be careful to give you the praise, honor, and the glory. Forgive us of our sins and receive our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You be seated in the presence of the Lord. Again, in keeping, it's warm in here today, isn't it? So it's not just me, huh? As soon as I stepped out of there, I said, man, somebody need to cut that heat down. I know I'm getting older, but I hope it ain't, I hope ain't what's happening is happening. <laughs> yeah, they said a change is about to come, but I don't, it, it needs to slow down. Amen. All right, and uh, notice in Jude, if you will, and I want to look at the verse 3 again, because there are three words in there that are of utmost importance. He says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly. That word contend comes from a Greek word that literally means to struggle and to strive for. To contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And the three words I want you to look at are the words once for all. Because those words indicate it doesn't change. It says the contend for the faith that was once for all, which means once for all times. From the very beginning to the end, the word of God does not change regardless how many changes takes place in the world. 
Now, for those of you that have some young people with you, I'm going to show a couple of video clippings. There's not going to be anything vulgar or anything. Just going to uh, kind of solidify what we're talking about today. But if you don't want them to see it, uh, then I encourage you to excuse yourself. But again, it's probably something they need to see because a lot of things that they're learning in school and on TV and, and then on social media is leading them down a path of destruction. And if there's any place that people, children, old and alike, ought to be able to come and get the truth, it ought to be the house of God. And so one of the greatest and most important, if not the most important command and exhortation that the Apostle Paul gives to his son Timothy in the faith is to fight the good fight of faith. That is to, to make sure, Timothy, that you understand you're not just coming into a lifestyle of casual Christianity where everything is going to be easy. In fact, you're going to be under attack and you're subject to lose your life, but fight the good fight of faith. And he gives in Hebrews 11 chapter, the anonymous writer, shares with us the history of, of, of many of the Old Testament saints who lived and died for what they believed in. And so in today's time, there's a lot of things that are being taught and a lot of things that are being taught behind the in the pulpit and behind podiums, in schools, on social media. And much of it, my brothers and sisters, is contradictory to the word of God. And it becomes my responsibility as a pastor and overseer of this congregation and those who join us by live stream or however else they join us by way of radio is to declare unto you what thus saith the Lord. In fact, in Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, the Bible says that God comes to Ezekiel and he says to him that if the nation of Israel raises up a watchman and they places that watchman in a position to watch and he discovers that there's trouble coming to the city and he does not blow the horn and give a warning, it says the people will die in their sins but the watchman will have to give an account for their souls. He says, but if he sees trouble coming and he blows the trumpet and he warns the people and they choose not to turn from their sins, he says then they will still die in their sins, but the watchman has delivered himself. And then he goes on to tell Ezekiel, he says, I made you a watchman for the nation of Israel. And when God raises up a genuine, a true pastor, he doesn't just raise up a person to entertain you and to make you feel good, he raises them up to watch over you, which is one of the reasons they're called overseers. And they're also in, uh, uh, in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, somewhere around verse 17, when it says, obey them to have rule over you, for they watch over your souls. So it becomes my responsibility not just to try to entertain you and carry you, which I do love to do, but also to warn you when there are certain things that are taking place in the world that we may be blind to. Amen. And so, and so I want to talk about uh, the biblical concept of fighting for our faith. The biblical concept of fighting for our, our faith. It's not just about trying to make it from day to day. He talks about faith as if there's something specific we fight for. And so the question has to be asked, what did Jude mean when he says that he was going to talk about salvation, but then he was led by the Spirit of God to ask that they would contend earnestly for the faith? That is to say he was writing at a time, just like when Paul wrote Timothy, when there were many false teachers creeping into the, uh, uh, the church and they were leading people astray. And he says that you got to fight for the faith. And so I have three things that I thought about when I was reading this. And the question came up, uh, what are we to fight for? And the first one I want to share with you is that we are to fight to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ doctrinally sound and pure. There's only one true doctrine. Amen. And, uh, and so it's the responsibility, not only of the pastor, but of the church universally to make sure that the doctrine remains pure and sound. Well, to help you understand what that means, the word sound 
comes from a definition in the Bible when it talks about sound doctrine. It means to be pure, to be healthy, to be wholesome, to be true and uncorrupted, which means sound doctrine, the sound doctrine. Doctrine is teaching and learning. So sound doctrine is that doctrine are, that's true, that's wholesome, that's healthy, that's uh, 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 uncorrupted and pure according to the word of God. And so, and so that's what sound is. So when we talk about sound doctrine, we're talking about not deviating from the word of God, but sticking to what the word of God says, even when the world says it's antiquated and outdated. The word of God never becomes outdated. Amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And so even before a man can become a pastor, according to Titus in 1 and 9, an overseer and eldership, the scripture says he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught by Christ and the apostles so that he may be able to give instruction in sound, wholesome, healthy, true, uncorrupted, pure doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. So, so even to be a pastor, one of the prerequisites of pastorship or eldership or to oversee a congregation is that you've got to be willing to speak the word of God. And you've got to do it truthfully and it must be trustworthy. So what is sound doctrine? According to Acts 2, uh, 2 and 42, we see that the scripture says, the first century church, it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine was the teaching of Christ. So whatever Christ taught, then the apostles taught the same thing. Amen. And then Jude, the third chapter, verse B, uh, 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 the B verse of that, or B clause, should I say. Uh, Jude says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly, struggle and strive for the faith which was once for all unchangeable and delivered to the saints. So why do we need sound doctrine? Well, let's walk through several scriptures, and the first one I want to take you to is Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 14. Why do we need sound doctrine? Why do we need it? Why is it so important in today's world and every age? Well, in Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter, let me get this here, verse 14. He says, and I'm going to back up and read just for the uh, sake of those that don't know this verse. It says, Jesus Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some technology. Uh, when you want it to work, it don't work. Uh, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect or mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now here it is, that we, why do we need sound doctrine? That we should no longer be children, tossed to and from and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. So that verse right there tells us that there are people that Satan has set up who literally disguise themselves as sheep for the sole purpose of leading God's people astray. If you look at another scripture, we look at 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. Just go forward a, a, a couple of books. And you look at 1 Timothy, the first chapter, and uh, you'll discover these words. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, and we're living in those days, that some will depart from the faith having uh, taken heed or given heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. Now there's only one devil, but there are many demons. And demons have a doctrine. What is a doctrine? A doctrine is a teaching. It is, it is something that you learn. And so he has, Satan has demons, are demonic forces who not only influence people, but who embody people for the sole purpose of leading God's people astray. And so, and so he says that there are doctrines of demons and they speak lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared like a hot iron. 
And so, and so there are people, and you look at people, and sometimes you wonder as they teach and preach the word of God, and it sounds good in many cases. Because remember, even Jesus said in, in, in Matthew, the 24th chapter, that he would come back soon, and he says, I'm going to cut the days short. He said, because if I don't cut the days short, even the elect will be deceived. And so that shows you how subtle Satan is, that he says, even the people that I have elected and I guarantee to be saved, he said, if I don't cut the days short, even they will be blinded. So it kind of gives you a glimpse of the power of Satan's deception. And he helps us, it helps us understand that we cannot take for granted what we see and just jump on the bandwagon of, with everything that takes place in the world as if it's always for our good. And so, it, it says, so he says, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of death. That's, that's why we need sound doctrine so we don't take heed or, or, or listen to these doctrines of demons. Look at another one in 2 Timothy. Go over one more book. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And again, this is going to be a study and just a learning sermon and lesson today. He says in verse 1, I charge you therefore before God. Now, Paul, for those of you that know the story here, quickly, Paul the apostle was on the verge of being executed and being beheaded by Nero. He understood that while he had been incarcerated on numerous occasions for preaching the gospel and living according to the gospel, this time would be his last time. So he turns the mantle over to Timothy, his son, and he says to him, while I'm getting ready to die, it's imperative and important that you understand you can't let the gospel die. Somebody has to continually declare the truth of God's word. And so he says, I charge you therefore uh, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word. Don't preach tradition. Don't preach denominationalism. Don't preach what you feel. Don't preach what people like. Don't preach what they... I've had people even try to tell me what to preach. He said, no, preach the word. He said, preach the word and then be ready in season and out of season. He says, convince, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and teaching doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure or receive or put up with sound, wholesome, uh, a true and pure doctrine. He says, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will find themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you watch, or be watchful in all these things, endure afflictions, why? Because telling the truth costs you. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So we are to fight to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ doctrinally sound. Now I wanna show you a couple of clippings as I show you in the first one is an old clipping that was Oprah Winfrey's theology. And Oprah Winfrey claims to be a Christian, like many other uh, televised uh, celebrities, if you will. Uh, and she has a theology that's contradictory and contrary to the Word of God. If we can get that up there and kind of get that going. But uh, let me just kind of explain to you because she literally believes what she says. And let's go, go ahead and play it, if you will. panel has been discussing the spirituality and the forces of God, but I also believe that there are two forces that are here with us, that we do have our, our, our God that we can depend on, but there is also a power of darkness that we do need to be aware of. And that's where the choice Do you begin. believe that, that you can choose between one or the other? Most, most absolute definitely. Yes. Now, now Marianne uh, Williamson says in her book, Return to Love, that we're always walking in the direction of one or the other. That all of your actions in life, either you're moving towards the darkness or you're moving toward the light. Pause it for a moment. Notice what she does. The lady speaks about spirituality according to the Bible. She quotes a book by an author. Not the Bible. So you missed, you may have missed that. I don't know if they can rewind it or not, but she literally brings forth an author 
that speaks differently that calls it the light. But let's go ahead and play it. Let's go ahead and go forward. And, and that's you, where the choice is. Do begin. you believe that, uh, that you can choose between one or the other? Most, most absolute definitely. Yes. Now, now, now Marianne uh, Williamson says in her book, Return to Love, that we're always walking in the direction of one or the other, that all of your actions in life, either you're moving toward the darkness or you're moving toward the light. Right. She calls it fear and love. There's this wonderful book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which talks it, which, which is. Anyway, it's a gorilla talking, but anyway. Uh, it talks about one of the points it brings out is one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to live. That's and that one we of don't mistakes accept we make. that there are diverse ways of being in the world, that there are millions of ways to be a then human being. God? And, and many ways, no, but many paths right. to what you call God. That and her crazy. path might be something else, and when she gets there, she might call it the light. But her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be on that, I mean, it, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? And you say there isn't only one way. There is one way and only one way, and there that is through Jesus. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because a million you of people say in the world. There, isn't. there couldn't possibly be. Because you say, you intellectualize it and say there isn't. If no. you don't believe that, you're all buying into the lie. But that makes you right. Do you think, do you think that if you, if you are somewhere on the planet, where are you so, if you're somewhere on the planet and you never hear the name of Jesus, you never hear the name of Jesus, but yet you live with a loving heart, you lived as Jesus would have had you to live, you lived for the same purpose that Jesus came to the planet to teach us all, but you are in some remote part of the earth and you never heard the name of Jesus, you cannot get to heaven, you think? And that is covered in the scriptures, too. People are talked about that. Truly. God knows the heart. Does God care about your heart or does God care about if you call his son Jesus? Well, you know... Oprah, God, Jesus cannot come back until that gospel is preached in the four corners of this earth. So, you know, figure it out. Okay, okay, I can't get into a religious argument with you. It's not now, think about this. Oprah Winfrey has influence over not only a lot of people around the world, but he, she has major influence over many celebrities, including T.D. Jakes, uh, Tyler Perry, and a host of other people, people who literally work up under her. But her theology has begun like a wildfire to spread and permeate throughout the world. Because people have this mindset just because you're rich you must be right. And, that, and the foolishness and absurdity of that is that they fail to realize, as I said at the 8 o'clock service, there are two, the lady said there's a light and darkness, but there are two major fathers, if you will, in the world. There's the father, the creator of heaven, and then there's father, Satan. Now, think about it from this perspective. I'm kind of dimming my light from me just a little bit on me. Uh, I'm not a celebrity, um, <laughs> but uh, but when you think about that, uh, it kind of made me lose my thought. <laughs> Satan, Satan, thank you. Satan is the father of the world. In Matthew the fourth chapter, when Jesus was being tempted and uh, had fasted for forty days, one of the things that Satan said to him is that I will give you all the things of the world if you fall down and worship me. Now in John the 10th chapter also, in the 8th chapter as well, Jesus calls the Pharisees, he says the reason you can't understand me is because you're not of me. He says you are of your father the devil. And so, and so the devil has the ability to make people rich. Now God can also make us rich, but we're not just called to be rich monetarily and materially. In fact, the Bible tells us not even to store up our treasures on earth. He says, but store them up in heaven where the moth can't get to them, where there can't no thief get to them. And so we don't labor for the riches of this world. We labor for the riches of eternity. And so, so Oprah has this theology about light and she calls herself a Christian. 
And she just got through talking about and introducing a book that T.D. Jakes, one of his most recent books, and it has nothing to do with Christ. It has everything to do with tapping into your inner self, the God that's in you. Now, we do talk about the God that's in us by way of the Holy Spirit, but that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about you being your own God and no longer dependent on the God who created you. And I'm going to show you that in the scriptures after a while, but, uh, but let's, let's look at the next one. I think I got another one up there for this one, and then we'll go to my next point. But, but Oprah's theology is not biblical. It's not pure. It's not wholesome. It's not true, and it is corrupted. Amen. And so, uh, and so we need to understand that. Uh, okay, so here's the big question. Are there many paths to get to the one God? Well, I believe, Oprah, that there, I believe that Jesus is the way to the one God. But I believe there are many paths to Jesus. He well, let's pause it, pause Jesus it. Jesus would reveal himself to somebody. Now, he says he believes that Jesus is the one way to get to God. But there are many paths to Jesus. How many paths are there to Jesus? Now, think about it. Before you answer, just kind of listen to what he says. Go ahead. So I'm not into excluding people. Jesus can reveal himself to anybody. Does that mean that all people, all races, obviously, in your, your, your church, we see all people, all races. I can't imagine that you have 16,000 people in there and none of them would be gay. So are gay people also included? Absolutely. Okay, let's stop right there. Now, what does she do? What does she do? She puts him on the, on the front by asking him a question about, are there gays in your church? Now, he says everybody in this church is going to heaven, basically. She wants to know if the gays are going with them. His response is, absolutely. Now, remember, doctrine has to be pure. It has to emanate from the word of God, and it cannot be altered or changed. And truth is not relevant to the day and age in which we live. Truth is unchangeable. That's what makes it truth. And although some politicians said it, there's no such thing as an alternative truth. Truth is truth. Amen. Amen. And, so, and so we have to understand that we can't be blind to these things. Look at 2 Peter, if you will, the second chapter, before I go into my second point. And in 2 Peter, the second chapter, Peter talks about this day and age in which we're going to live in. And it has been since the church has been established, but it's going to get worse and worse. But Joel Osteen is not a gospel preacher. He's a motivational preacher. He is not preaching Christ. Anytime you say a preacher won't preach about sin, that's a false preacher. Because the very reason Christ came into the world was for the sins of the world. And when Jesus preached, one of the first sermons that he preached and all the disciples preached was the, uh, was the gospel of repentance. Repent. You don't hear about repentance anymore. You don't hear people talking about, everybody wants to say, your blessing is on the way. God's getting ready to do. God's getting ready to do. Sow a seed. God's going to do this. Sow a seed. You got to have faith. You got to have faith to believe. You name it and claim it. That is not biblical. Because all of the stuff that's being preached like that is self-centered. True Christianity is not self-centered. It's Christ-centered. Which means if I ain't got a dime in my pocket, I'm content because I know how to be down in him and I also know how to be up in him. And so we've got to be, we cannot afford to be blinded by the, by the corruption that is taking place when it comes to the gospel. Notice what Peter says in 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning at verse one, he said, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Teachers doing what? False doctrine. He says, uh, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many, not a few, but many will follow the destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Now for the way of truth to be blasphemed, which means to go against God or to speak irrelevantly against God, the truth can only be blasphemed if they call themselves dealing with the truth. So it means they're not outside the church, they're inside the church. 
and they're taking the truth of God's word and corrupting it for their own profit. And then it goes on to say here, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blaspheming by covetousness or greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. And people say, well, why does God allow it to happen? God allows it because there's an appointed time when the devil and all who follow him will be destroyed. So they get to live out their life. When the, when the current president, before he was elected, and, uh, and he's not the only wicked one that's ever come through there, but before he was elected, he made a statement that even if he shot somebody in the middle of Madison Square, he would still be elected. And before he came to that point of saying that, I had already told several people, this guy is influenced by the devil. But then when he made that statement, I said, he's not influenced by the devil, he's possessed by the devil. I don't have anything against him personally, but for to make a statement that confidently, before you get elected, says you understand you have an hour. And the Bible talks about certain kings and presidents, ten horns that will be raised up, who will have an hour, who will be introducing the into Antichrist. So to say that in the very beginning, before you get elected, and to have the confidence that no matter what I do, cuss folk out, grope women, do all this kind of stuff, I will still be your president. Why? Because I know my hour. You can't be that confident without knowing something. You can't consistently lie and then change it the next moment and still keep people, so-called evangelicals, pro protecting you. When the Bible says eventually there's going to be a one world religion. Yeah. All religion is not biblical. So he says we are to fight to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ doctrinally sound and pure. The second thing we are to fight for is we are to fight to keep our faith and our lives morally pure. Now how, how do we define morality? Morality is defined and the standard of morality must derive from the word of God and not the world. We discover what's right and wrong from God. And God in his creating of us, which answers the question that, uh, uh, that uh, Oprah was asking, what about people that don't get to hear uh, the, uh, the name Jesus? Well, Romans talks about that also because in God's creative order, he says people are without excuse. You can't look at the sky and not know there's a God. Not only that, God has given us a conscience that even before we learn right from wrong, we already know how to do wrong. Have you ever noticed no parent has literally had to teach their children how to sin? That they have to teach them how to do right? We don't, we don't think that we have to teach our children how to do wrong. The whole concept of parenthood is to protect your children from going astray. Why? Because we have a sin nature. Innately, we're sinful. So we don't have to learn how to sin. We do it automatically. I've shared in a few Bible studies, and I may have shared in a sermon before that where I said, when you think about a child, and as they begin to de develop, and then they begin to become what we call toddlers, and say they're one years of age or somewhere in that area, and they're curious about everything. And one of the things you'll notice that if their parents are adults in the room, and let's say they get ready to knock over a lamp, they want to know what happens if the lamp gets knocked over. Have you ever noticed before they knock the lamp over, they look at the adults? Why? Because there's a conscience in there that's speaking to them and telling them right from wrong, but because they're not mature, they want to see what the adults say. If the adults say no, 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 they kind of leave it alone, unless they're baby kids. <laughs> but in most cases, but watch this, if the parents or the adults just smile, it's almost like a green light because they can't understand that. The whole point is you don't have to be taught to sin, you got to be taught to live right. And so, and so the standard for righteousness comes from the word of God, our God himself. And the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the word of God is God breathed. 
which means just like in Genesis 2 and 7 when it says God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. God breathed upon the word and the word becomes the life for everybody who receives it. That's why it's called a, 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 like a living sword, if you will. It, it lives because it, it was created by God's breath. All right, so, so look at Romans, the first chapter. Now, we are to fight to keep our faith and our lives morally pure. Romans, the first chapter, and I want to go to uh, verse 18 to begin. I'm going to walk through this, and uh, I hope this is helping you. Uh, in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, which means if they knew God, they, that means they had to come into truth at least, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became fruit, uh, futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God has also given them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Remember that lady said that too, you bind into the lie. Uh, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vow of passions for even their women exchange the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, says the word of God, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate or debased mind, which is a mind not to know right from wrong. Which means when you when you when you bent on doing wrong and you keep going down that path, God said, I eventually give you a mind where you don't know how to do right. He says they're being filled with all, uh, all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness, they are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, bolsters, inventors of evil things disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they do the same, but they also approve those who practice them. Now again, we are to fight to keep our faith pure and morally pure. Look at 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. Beginning at verse 9, and I will uh, pull the video up as well. In verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, what did, what did uh, Oprah say? Everybody goes to heaven. The Bible says if you're unrighteous, you're not going. It ain't got nothing to do with hating certain people or anything. It's just the truth. And believe it or not, I've been saved 40 years now, but I knew that before I got saved. I knew in my heart that I was living wrong. I knew the dirt that I did was wrong. And I knew that if I died, I was going to hell. That was before I got saved. And so he says, do you not know that the righteous will, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And just not getting into Oprah's life again, but just last week I heard her say that her and Stedman been together 35 years. 
How you sleep with somebody 35 years and not be married and going to heaven anyhow? We have, it, we have it ready? Go for it. Remember, the, the thing is, we have to fight to keep our faith and our lives morally pure. Go ahead. He founded one of the most prominent mega churches in America and has been pastor of George's Church in the Now for 25 years. Twice married, a father of four, Pastor Jim Swilly just revealed Monday that he's gay, a secret he's been struggling with since childhood. Coming out now, he says, is not simply a personal decision. As Steve Osinsami reports, the pastor hopes his public testimony will save young lives. And I wouldn't have known what to it was a difficult was admission Monday. in front of the church he founded east of Atlanta. Bishop Jim Swilly has been married twice and is the father of four, but one week ago, he says he was moved to share that he's gay. I know a lot of straight people think that uh, orientation is a choice. I want to tell you that it certainly is not. He says he's coming out now because of gay suicides. Every one, he says, is one too many. He says he hopes his truth will save a life. To think about saving a teenager, yeah, I'll, I'll risk my reputation for that. As a father, um, I think about, you know, think about your 16, 17 year old <clears throat> killing themselves. The suicides have certainly changed the discussion across the country since September 22nd when 18 year old Tyler Clementi jumped off a bridge after his roommate allegedly revealed his sexuality on the internet there have been rallies and vigils and one man started a movement online. I was obviously gay and some kids didn't like that. Dan Savage did the first video. He called the campaign It Gets Better. Hearing about these kids who are committing suicide, the reaction as a gay adult is always, God, I wish I could have just talked to him for 15 minutes or five minutes and told them it gets better. Three weeks later, at a city council meeting in Fort Worth, Texas, gay city councilman Joel Burns was moved to share his emotional story, how close he came to killing himself when he was just 13. Life got so much better for me, and I want to tell any teen who might see this, give yourself a chance to see just how much life how much better life will get. And soon on YouTube, a chorus of voices. It gets better. I care. A lot of people care. From the president to the cast of Jersey Shore, telling gay youth. And every day, it gets better. Bishop Swilly says he is proof his family, including his ex-wife, remain by his side. He believes that God loves you for who you are. For Good Morning America, Steve Osinsami, ABC News, Atlanta. Amen. Now, let's kind of walk through that. I'm going to do my best as I can from memory. First of all, he says it's not a choice. It is a choice. It's like anything else growing up in the world. We all grow up with illicit feelings. Think about it. We all have feelings about doing stuff that we ain't got no business doing. It becomes our choice to engage in it or to not engage in it. But just because it's a feeling doesn't make it right. If you take that concept that you've been feeling it since you were a child, which means it must be from God, then you can't just do it one-sided. Because I grew up in neighborhoods where I know one particular family, and I've shared this before, where everybody, including a grandmother and everybody else, were thieves. So be, imagine being born in that home. And your mama's a thief, your dad is a thief, your grandmama's a thief, your siblings are thieves. Well, it would become natural for you to feel that's what you're supposed to be. But your feelings doesn't make it right. Because what, and, and, and just to say that he's doing it to save these children who are committing suicide, let me first and foremost say, I believe it's absolutely wrong for any person to be treated uh, uh, unjustified or uh, in any kind of way for, for their sexual orientation. I think on jobs, y'all be paid for what you're able to do. I don't think they'll be beat up, I don't think they'll be bashed, but I don't believe that we ought to buy into the lie just because they got feelings. I've got feelings, but my feelings are not always accurate. So when you think about it from that perspective, just because their feelings doesn't make it right. Because if that's the case, the rapist can say, I've been feeling this way all my life. But do you operate and act on it because that's what you feel? 
How many times have we heard you don't you don't say everything that comes to your mind? You don't say everything come don't let everything come out of your mouth that comes to your mind. Just because you're tempted to say something don't mean it's got to come out. We make choices. That's one of the ways God created us. And he does not make us robots, which means he doesn't make us do anything. Saved or unsaved. He leaves us with that choice. And so then he says his wife supports him. However, she divorced him. So if it was right, why didn't you stick with it? The, the tragedy of this is he's been preaching for 21 years, at least pastor in that church for 21 years. He's come out now like a lot of other celebrities and people. And if you notice that most of them that have an impact are those that's got great followings. And he's come out now and people applaud it. I'm not against a person like style. Homosexuality has been around way before we got here. But I said earlier, the, uh, people say, well, why is everybody picking on the homosexuals? People are not picking on homosexuals. Homosexuals are the only ones trying to legalize their immorality. You don't see fornicators at the legislature uh, 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 down there, Frank was saying, make me legal. You don't see adulterers down there saying, make me legal. So the reason so many people are talking about homosexuals is because homosexuals are pushing the agenda to, to live a lifestyle that's immoral because they want to legalize it. But you don't legalize sin. Even Obama, he messed that thing up. Trying to be equal. Well, some things you ain't got to do. Don't deal with it. It was before you got, it was there before you got there. Leave it alone. And so we've got to understand just because people are in high positions and just because people seem like they're knowledgeable are because they have multiple degrees and certain positions and power and finance, it does not make them right. And you got to understand Satan sets up these type of people because if he's going to lead the world astray, he's got to put people in the positions that will have an impact and greater influence on the world. Somebody like me is not going to have that kind of impact because the world don't know me. But as a celebrity, as an entertainer, as, as, as an athlete, then you come out there and you're known and you influence other people. And many people have sold into the lie by saying, well, if God blessed them, evidently he'll bless me. But maybe it's not God blessing them. Maybe it's God blinding them. I mean, not God blinding them. Maybe it's not God blessing them. It's Satan blinding them. I think we have another one up there. I'm going to show this other one, and uh, we should be okay after this one. We're going to close out. This is what's happening now, not only in Atlanta, but across the nation. Kind of slow it down before you go to the next one. My wife and I have been here going on 17 years, Lord willing, as a pastor on July the 14th. Lord willing, we will celebrate our anniversary. I ain't never called that, but several members say it's pastor and first lady. And it is between me and her because we're married, if that's what they want to call it, first lady. But now they have pastor and first gentleman. That's what this is. These are two men that are married, who pastor church, and they're celebrating their third year anniversary, and they have a great following. Go to the next one, if you will, and kind of just sit there. Here's another one, celebrating four years. Two men that are married, pastoring churches celebrating their fourth year anniversary who have great following. What's this one here? These are two women, pastors, great followers. And let's just back up for a minute. These people preach from the Bible. That's two more, pastor and first gentleman. What has happened to us to where we can't discern between good and evil, right and wrong? Now, somebody said, well, it's just about love, Pastor. And they say it's natural. 
Well, remember in Genesis, when God said in Genesis 1:26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have a dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl, the cow, and all the things that creep up on earth. Verse 27 said, God bless them, male and female, he made them. And then it says in verse 28, he says, go forth and subdue the earth and multiply. What does that mean? Reproduce. Which means male and female can naturally reproduce. So if homosexuality is natural, why can't they naturally reproduce? If lesbianism is natural, why can't they naturally reproduce? You know why? It's not natural. You don't grow oranges on apple trees because it ain't natural. <laughs> grapes bring forth grapes. And we are bought into this world and this lie today because people of high caliber in the world says it's okay, but it's not okay. It's wrong. And I'm not saying it because I hate anybody. I love everybody. And then that's another thing. He said, well, God loves everybody. God does love everybody. But remember, his love was what sent his son into the world. John 3, 16, the scripture, everybody know God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If he just loved us for where we were and how we were, he wouldn't have sent Christ into the world to save us. Yes, he loved us, but he didn't love us enough to let us die. He loved us too much to leave us like we were. The fact that he sent his son into the world says, yes, he loved us. But he loved us too much to let us go down a path of our own destruction. So he sent the Savior that would take our sins and die in our place and be buried in our place and be risen on our behalf and promises if we stick to the word, he will come back for a church without spot or wrinkle. We are called to fight to keep the gospel of Jesus Christ doctrinally pure and sound, to keep our lives and our faith morally pure, and we're to fight to keep the faith and the church missional, and that is we got to understand we're not just here as a church, we are a missional church, and that means every day we ought to be telling somebody about Christ. People are dying around us everywhere we go. And to say I ain't got a chance to talk to, to share the God, I say that's not my personality, it don't have to be your personality. Tell somebody. Because people are dying, young people are dying at 15 and 20, 30 years of age for heart attacks. The food that we uh, ingest on a daily basis is killing us. And people are dying without knowing Christ. If you believe in God, Jesus says in John 14, believe also in me. But if you believe in the true God of the Bible, you got to believe not only in heaven, you got to believe in hell. And there's only two destinies that we're going to go to. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. I suggest, according to Romans 10 and 9, that if you will confess with your mouth Jesus Christ as your Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, you shall be saved. What if I've gone astray? John, 1 John 1 and 9, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But nobody has to go to hell, but people have chosen to. Not because they had to. They rejected the grace of God and the truth of his word. Let us stand. Father, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, for your word, we praise you for your goodness and your kindness. We pray that your word will go forth and not return to you void, but accomplish the purpose for which you've sent it. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a, I meant to give you this, it says the church, from a mission of church, the church is sent by Jesus Christ, the church is sent with the cross, the church is sent in community, the church is sent to every culture. And the church is sent for the king and his kingdom. And I got that off the internet to talk about what we are as a missional church. I want to extend an invitation to those who are here today. You may not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You can change that today by simply receiving his word and confessing him as your personal Lord and Savior. God loves you. God wants you to be saved. But God loves you too much to leave you like you are. 
He loved me as I was before I got saved, but he loved me too much to leave me like I was. And so I'm a change agent, if you will. I'm an agent of change, and God has been changing me, and he's been using me to be a reconciler to others to help change them. If you're willing today and you wouldn't have trust God, would you be bold enough and courageous enough to come for the first time? Or even to rededicate your life. Maybe you said I was in the church and most of us have been through it. We went astray. But you can come back today. You don't have to live this life without him. You don't have to be miserable. Your real joy comes from a right relationship with him. Not about how much money you got. Not about where you live. It's about knowing him genuinely and him living in you. If you don't have a church home and if you would like to rededicate your life, praise the Lord. But come forth and do so. Maybe you want to become a part of our church family. If you don't have a church home and you want to become a part of our church family, we want you to come and grow with us as we attempt to live out our faith for the glory of God. It might be someone else. If you don't have a church home, want to rededicate your life, want to come to Christ for the first time, need somebody to pray with you, pray for you. Life is too short and unpredictable to gamble with your soul. Make that decision today. You don't even have to join our church. But if you don't have a personal relationship with him, we just want you to know Jesus. We'll take you in the back and form you, and you can go on about your way. But do come to know him. Come to know him for yourself. Because you can't get to heaven on mama's religion. You can't get there on your brother's religion. You can't get there just by joining a local church. You got to know him for yourself. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But God wants you to have that everlasting life. If you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship, want to rededicate your life, want to become a part of our church family, need somebody to pray with you, would you trust him today with your heart, trust him with your soul, trust him with your mind, trust him with your life. The everlasting life way out but I want to continue to ask that we would pray for all of our members we got several members that have had uh, uh, death in the family we've got members who are in the hospital we've got members who are homebound but uh, one of the most recent ones I want to pray for brother hooks who is also uh, uh, going through something right now in the hospital we pray for him also be in prayer for uh, pastor Leonard Boyd who is also in the hospital and pray for him and his recovery as well uh, continue to pray for our church family. Continue to pray for me and my family. I'm praying for you on a daily basis. I'm praying that God will use us to be lights in a dark world. And not just to shine as if we're better or anything like that, because we're not. But God has called us to love everybody. But loving everybody doesn't mean accepting everything. It means try learning how to convey the truth of God in a loving way so that people can understand that they need Christ. I want to encourage you to come back on Wednesday for our Noonday Bible study. And also come back that evening. If you can't make Noonday, come back in the evening. Uh, at 7, we have prayer preceding both of those services. And also I ask that you will continue to be here on uh, Sundays. Bring somebody with you. We're trying to literally reach every person we can with the gospel of truth. God wants us to share his truth. If you got family members, if you got loved ones that are not serving God or not, don't know him, write their names down and put, just put the last name or the first name and drop it in the prayer box so we can start praying for their souls. You don't want your family members, you don't want your loved ones ending up in a destiny that they took for granted. We want to pray for them. I want to ask that you would just uh, leave her today in carriage and know that all is well with your soul. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the privilege of worshiping you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, God, for the spirit of worship today. We thank you for your word. 
we give you all the praise, honor, and the glory for any good that has been done. And we pray, God, as we depart from this place, may we never depart from your presence. Keep us in your perfect peace. Keep us in your grace. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever. Let the believing heart say amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Have a great week.